that the life of sanctification and the life of being worshipped to God and uh, how that looks as believers as we live a sanctified life. I've been trying to delve into the Word of God and I kind of feel like I'm just kind of here and I'm not ready to move because I think it's a place where we can draw riches from the well. So I pray that we can do that tonight. I pray that we can challenge each of us in our faith and our walk with Christ as we mature, but as we uh, uh, grow deeper in this process of sanctification. Since sanctification is an instantaneous but a continual work, and God is on the move, and it's a process that we are on as we move with God in the direction that God wants us to be. And that's what creates a healthy environment for all of us in the church is that we're all in a process. And no one may be at the same process or at the same place in the process, but we all need to continue in the process of sanctification. Let me just share a little uh, scenario today, uh, share with some of you. Um, as I was thinking about church and thinking about my day, prayerful throughout my day, um, uh, trial work, I think about Tuesday evening throughout the week, but then you know the ball coming is, you know, Sunday for Tuesday getting ready, uh, thinking about uh, just sanctification today, our girls started a new journey as they started preschool. And uh, it was a journey for all of us. Um, and uh, uh, I'll make a long story short, I won't worry about all the details, but we knew it was going to be a big adjustment for uh, them and for us too. And uh, uh, so when we left them today, we left them in a situation uh, where they weren't happy to say goodbye to us and tell us this new environment. And so uh, we left very abruptly and uh, it was tearful for me, tearful for my wife, because there was a sense of abandonment um, that we kind of felt as parents, you know, feel like there's an abandonment, we know it's healthy, we know it's good, uh, but it still felt that way. Now, when I went to school, it was quite the opposite. My mom said I started when I was four, and I've always been small all my life, and uh, my mom said she remembers so worried about me having to get up on this big school bus with these little legs, and she said that she had walked me to the end of the driveway. And she said, I got up on the school bus and I walked up on the bus. And she stood there to wait by. I didn't even turn around. I didn't say goodbye. No, nothing was on the bus and I was off and gone. So where we felt like we were abandoning, uh, I guess my mom felt the opposite, like I was abandoning her. Right? So it's kind of all in how it transpires and all in perspective. And, uh, you know, the Word of God commands us to come out from the world and be separate. And if we don't do that, do you think that God gets the sense that we're abandoning Him and His work? Or when we do do what God has called us to do, does the enemy see and the flesh see that I've abandoned the things of this flesh and I've abandoned the things of the enemy and I follow wholeheartedly after God? And so that's what sanctification is all about. Letting the world know that I've abandoned you. I'm, not, I'm no longer in citizenship to you. I'm no longer in relationship to you. But I've abandoned you because I now have a, 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 a new citizenship. I now have a new position. I now have a new relationship with God that I didn't have before. And so I'm abandoning the world. And that's what sanctification is all about. And I know that's just uh, everyday logic. And that is some, uh, some, some typology from everyday. But let's dive into the Word of God. Let's look at it this evening. Turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter number 1. And I, hopefully I can be educational to you by giving you uh, education from the Word of God, as well as uh, I, I, I'm prayerful tonight that we can gain some understanding from the Word of God as well. So there's a couple different passages I want to look at as we look at sanctification and separation. 
Uh, we looked uh, specifically at scriptures over the past few weeks. Now that, that, that are in the New Testament where Paul deals with maturity, he talk, deals with saints, he deals with holiness, he deals with living holy. We've looked at that. But I want to look at uh, uh, some examples from the Word of God where we find that there was a challenge to men to face some strong temptations, uh, some new challenges in their faith, yet they remain steadfast and they remain strong and they remain proactive in their relationship with God. So I want to look at that for a few moments this evening. Uh, someone, if you would, read Daniel chapter number 1, verse number 1 through 5. Uh, one through five. Then someone else, after that person is done, pick up in verse number eleven and read through verse number sixteen. So Daniel one through five, and then someone else, Daniel one eleven through sixteen. Okay, with well, the first person, please read. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, under Jerusalem, besieged it. The Lord gave unto Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. Carried into the land of Shinar, the house of his God, and he brought the vessel into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring the servant of the children of Israel and the king's seed of the princes, children of whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. All right. Uh, well, well, would you just read verse number 8, and then the next person jump into verse number 11? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, go to verse number 8. But then, right. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Very good. Someone read verse number 11 through verse number 16. Be said. I'll try to be specific. I'll try to um, share uh, a little bit about Daniel, a little bit about what's happening uh, here with his three friends. But we know that these were uh, among those that were carried away from Judah to Babylon during the captivity, uh, 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 during Jehoiakim's reign at least, uh, as we look at this. And uh, those that were there as uh, Brother Justin and Sister Rachel read, uh, there are four that we're looking at in particular that were young men, and you'll find them throughout the book of Daniel. And Daniel writes this book, uh, and he's sharing about him and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Now, when we look at Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who are we looking at? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, probably more so the terminology that we maybe would know them as from growing up in Sunday school. Um, and so we find that they come from uh, these young men, uh, probably uh, around 17 years of age, Daniel is, and these young men, uh, they strove to maintain their integrity before God, uh, even at the risk of losing political position at the risk of, uh, uh, of wealth that could be handed 
dealt them at the risk of even their health. Their life could be taken from them. And so uh, Daniel, this writer of this uh, uh, prophetic book, and we know that it is a book of prophecy, uh, uh, 17 years of age when he's carried away, and he and his three Hebrew friends uh, 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 are really put under some pressure. And so the king is choosing some, some individuals here who he is going to use for leadership. And, uh, and so we first find the name of a man introduced here, uh, uh, Ashpenaz, who is second in command under Nebuchadnezzar. So you, you can imagine the breakdown. You look at the officers in our government. You look at the officers maybe even in your workplace or various places where there is the top and then it, it trees down out to various people. And so here it is that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar chooses uh, uh, Ashpenaz to, uh, to, to master these three men. And uh, he was a eunuch. Now, when we are looking at eunuchs here, uh, our mind may think of this, I'm going to safely say this, uh, 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 of men who would not be married, they would be castrated, but this is not the case. Uh, the, we find that also there was a eunuch of previous in Scripture whose name was Potiphar, and we know that he was married. What this eunuch means is this, is it means that they were uh, 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 a, 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 an officer, they were somewhere within leadership, is what this word eunuch means here. And you'll find that that is pretty much the general consensus of everybody who gives you commentary on this. And so to kind of clear up on our mind to understand that here's an officer who has been given the charge of training other officers. So that's simply who this Ashpenaz is. And uh, 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 as he is uh, deemed uh, 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 the one who's going to be uh, training, the one who's second command, amen, he was literally in charge of these four Hebrews to make them uh, officers, or in this terminology, eunuchs. And so, uh, uh, so here they are. They're going to be trained in the Babylonian language. They're going to be trained in the Babylonian education. Uh, 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 here they are. Uh, they were some particulars about these men who were to be trained. They were to come from the king's seat. So there was something, uh, when we look at the Word of God, the Bible says uh, that... that uh, they bring children of Israel uh, of the king's seed, uh, chapter verse number three, and of uh, uh, princesses, uh, prince princes. I'm sorry, uh, uh, pluralizing and changing the whole word together. Princes, uh, children in whom there was no blemish. So they look good. They're well uh, favored. The Bible says that they were to be skillful in wisdom. And so they were also to be cunning in knowledge. They had to be able to gain knowledge. They wanted smart. So they needed to be royalty. They needed to look good. They needed to be learned individuals. But they need to also have that capacity to be able to learn. The Bible says that they had to have an understanding of the science. And, and, and they had to stand in the king's palace. This king wanted all good-looking, great people round about him. That's just how it was in the king's court. He had chose those who were going to look good, and he wanted to, if you would, brainwash uh, these that were brought into Babylonian captivity from Judah. He wanted to brainwash them. He wanted to make them feel at home and, and battle on. He wanted to give them the best. He wanted them to feel luxury that they would never, ever, ever want to go back to their, their homeland. And so here he is. He's making all these choices. And once again, uh, the Bible says that they were to be well favored. They were to have a good complexion. They were to look healthy. Uh, there was a standard of appearance that was, that was so important. You know, uh, uh, everything about these men, he wanted uh, them to just be head and shoulders, if you would, above the rest. And uh, he wanted them to be able to stand in the king's palace. And there was rigorous uh, 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 standards that was going to be brought to them that they might be taught the learning and the tongue of, 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 the, of the Chaldeans. 
And so here they are, the Chaldeans, uh, 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 we, want, we want to train them. We want them to feel comfortable in our land and uncomfortable where they were, once were. Uh, the new traditions, new laws, new lands, uh, all the luxury. Uh, uh, and he's going to make them servants of the king. I mean, he does whatever he can do to make them feel comfortable. Let me just say, isn't the call of the world much like that? Get as comfortable as you can in this world. The prince of the power of the air of this world, the enemy of the devil, uh, a royal liar and seeking whom he may devour, he wants to do whatever he can do. He wants you to be educated in the things of this world. He wants you to feel comfortable in this world. He wants you to be so afraid of dying. And He wants you uh, 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 not to think about it, to be caught up in the here and now. He wants you to feel comfortable in this world uh, that, that, that is fleeting. But that's what the enemy is trying to do. And so uh, uh, the king, he went on a further purpose that he was going to give them daily provisions. They weren't going to eat as other people ate. They were going to eat from the king's table. I mean, they were going to eat the very best of the best. Now, can you imagine, uh, you know, in, in, in your life, if, you, if you've only had hot dogs all your life, and all of a sudden someone puts a good T-bone steak down before you, and you sink your teeth into that, man, you're like, this is all right. I can get used to this. Can you imagine that if all, you know, if you, you had the choice every day, uh, Brother Doug, to eat a nice T-bone or filet mignon, and, and, and maybe someone said to you, well, well here is a, 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 a box of veggie burger. We'll give that to you. What would you say? Oh, I like what we're eating. Right? So I'm not talking about health questions. I'm just talking in general. Right? Okay? So he wanted their, their quarters that they lived in to be furnished with the most elaborate of things. I mean, he was doing whatever he could do to make them feel comfortable. They were going to be trained in the school for three years. Three years training they would be given. And so the Bible says that Daniel had already purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat. He wasn't going to defile himself morally. He wasn't going to defile himself spiritually. And so it's very clear that he had a strong conviction that he didn't care if he had to endure ridicule or if he had to go through difficulty or even if he had to face death itself. He was not going to defile himself with living less than what God had called him to live. He knew what his moral compass was set at. He knew where the standard was. He may have been taken away into captivity, but he knew who his God was and who he was going to be faithful to. And so here it is that Daniel proceeds to make to uh, uh, Ashpenaz uh, uh, this, that I, 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 I'm not going to, to, to partake in this. And so we find that, that, that here it is that Daniel, uh, uh, he, he refuses to partake, and uh, 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 the Lord grants him favor. And uh, Sister Rachel, as you read, then we have Melzar, who's underneath uh, uh, the third in command, Ashpenaz, who, who is there. And so they, they make uh, this consideration to him. Listen, would you for ten days just allow us, uh, would, would you allow us just to have pulse and water? Now, pulse, does anyone know what pulse is? So it would be like vegetables, lentils, dried uh, beans. It would be like herbs, all in that category of things that can be harvested, dried, and could be used to eat. He said, I'm going to pass everything up. Just give me, just give me the beans and the herbs and the water. Well, uh, you know, and, 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 and so uh, uh, he said, just so that I can prove, that I can prove, after 10 days, take a look at us and see how we are. And the Bible says that uh, after those 10 days, that they did not defile themselves with the king's meat. Amen. Uh, anything that was sown, those beans, those lentils, those herbs, fruits, among other things. The Bible says, as thou seest, deal with us. Here they are on a meager diet. But we find that when they are looked at, the Word of God says in verse number 13, 
Then our, let our countenance be looked upon before you and the countenance of the children who eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as you see, deal with your servants. So he consented to them to this matter and proved them ten days. The Bible says that at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink and gave them pause. Could I just stop here for a minute to say something? We live in this world, but we're not of this world. We do not have to partake of the things of this world to be able to fare well in life. We don't, we don't need those things. What we need is the conviction of God's word in our life. That is our moral compass. That is our compass that leads us in our life. I was talking to us already over the past several weeks about sanctification. How does this apply to us? I want to say this. If not for the king, if not for Ashpenaz or Melzar, would you just do it for yourself and say, listen, I'm going to take 10 days. And I'm just going to take the things of God. And it may seem like it's bare. It may seem like it, 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 it's not what the world can give. But I'm going to take it and I'm going to give it a test. I believe this. That when we live by the authority of God's Word. Amen. And we stand upon God's Word. We will not come out looking lean. We will not come out looking less fair. We will not come, in, come out looking like we have partaken of less. But I believe a God who sustains, amen, when we stand upon the conviction of His Word, when He has planted it in our heart, will show that we come out greater and fairer than anyone else. Amen. I'm talking about sanctification. Amen. That is evidence. Daniel purposed it in his heart. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Aspenaz couldn't look and see it. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar couldn't look and see it. Maybe Melzar couldn't look and see everything in Daniel's heart. But there came a day when he said, listen, we will not defy ourselves with this. This is our conviction. I don't know everything that was going on with the food. I'm not even going into that. I'm just saying there was conviction in Daniel's heart that he would not do it because it went against the conviction of who he was before the authority of the God that he loved. And he said, I will not change my conviction even though I risk not having a great position. Even all these luxuries that I have, I may not have them. I e e even I the hope of someday going into a good position. I'm not getting settled and satisfied in this position because my heart longs to go where God can be my God. And I know that I will not always be in captivity, but God will deliver me. I want to say this to us tonight. What are the things that God has convicted your heart Stand by. Stand upon the authority of His Word. When we read the Word of God, it convicts our heart and we say, I can't live this way. And it goes against the integrity and the holiness of God. And because of an act of worship that is going on internally, it will express itself externally. It will have to. So if it's a standard if it's a standard of our appearance, if it's a standard of things that we partake in, if it's a standard of anything that we feel is contrary to the Word of God, we've got to trust God. Even if it seems less. We're living in a wicked, wicked, wicked world that is against the morality and the standard of godliness and holiness. We've got to stand. Did David know about it, Justin? That, that, that his position would be secure? He knew God was able to do it. But he was also willing to say, I'll risk it. I don't need this food. I don't need this luxury. I don't need that position. 
who I'm defined as is who I am in God. Our definition of who we are should be defined as who we are in Christ. Listen. That is why we dress that is why we just dress distinctively, men and women. That is why we still define marriage as, as being abstinent until you come together in the holy covenant of marriage. And you ask God to bless it. Amen. That means that that which is holy and that which is set apart unto marriage, the Bible says that a man and a woman, uh, 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 that, that if they come together in the union physically, outside the union of marriage, that that is fornication if they've never been married before. That is why we abstain from that. Amen. So it does one of two things. If someone is in that relationship, they stop and separate. Or else if they're in the liberty of being able to be married, then they get married. That defines it. I didn't define it. God defines it. It's sad that we have to say it nowadays, but marriage is still between one man and one woman as defined by the Word of God. That is what we biblically see when we look at the Word of God. So everything, and, and you know, that's not even holiness. I mean, as far as the nitty gritty, you know, you would think that that's just, just common sense. But the world don't have it. Because sin warps all that. There was a wonderful Bible student who was a scholar and 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 in and, 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 and Great Britain, he was doing great things. And he went to to Trinity uh, College in Dublin, and he was doing so well. And, and he was given some opportunity, and he didn't take it. And he was asked the question, "Aren't you concerned? Don't you want to make a name for yourself in this world?" And Mr. Kelly responded, "I guess that would depend upon which world." In our life, where are we trying to make a difference? In this world or in that world? I've not met very many people in my life that is so spiritually minded that there are no earthly good. So don't worry about being too spiritually minded. When we get spiritually minded, we give this world thoughts. Once again, let me say to you, if you're struggling with things of how can I worship God in a holy, sanctified life, maybe you need to say, okay, I'm giving God 10 days. I'm not literally saying 10 days. I'm just saying that as a Christian, so to speak. I trust the sovereign God with the best results that he had. That's what Daniel did. Daniel trusted the sovereign God to give the best results as he trusted God with his best decisions. But God is dealing with things to draw you closer. Prayer, reading the Word of God. Maybe He does sometimes convict the things in our life that we take our time and so that we can focus more upon Him. And maybe we should trust God. Even when it doesn't seem like rational, it's a solution. But we're not putting our treasure in this world. Our heart is in heaven. And that's where our treasure is. I hardly have time to do this, but I'm going to do it. Because it's part of what I want to share tonight as I look at our heart and what is in our heart is reflected outwardly. And knowing that God sees our heart, even our hearts need to be seen by God 
I believe that what's in our heart will be reflected on the outside as well, and then we'll see. The most important thing is knowing that our hearts are right with God. That is real worship to God. It can be easy to come into church and our heart not to be right, but still lift our hands and lift our voice. Do you think God sees our worship, or do you think God sees our heart? I believe God looks at the heart. And so we need to get to the heart of the matter and make sure our hearts are right with God. A sinner can come in and raise their hand and they can look good. But God sees the heart. So that worship really doesn't mean anything unless the heart is saved and pure and changed. What did he say in Ezekiel? That he takes that old stony heart out of us and he puts a heart of flesh in it. So God can take that heart that's cold and hard and he can take it out and he can put a heart of flesh in it. I read the news today. Uh, the news was talking about that there was a heart transplant done, a heart surgery done in, in Tennessee. And once the surgeon had everything all sewn up, guess what he discovered? There was a needle missing. And so they discovered that the needle was inside the man. They went back in to get the, the needle. They could not find it. The man died a month later after the heart, uh, heart procedure because uh, the physician messed up. Can I tell you this, that we had a great physician that can change our heart, our stony heart, and he won't mess up. There's not death, there's not destruction, there's not complications after he changes our hearts, but there's nothing but a 100% success rate with this physician. Allow him to change your heart. Real worship is a heart change. The Word of God says in 1 Samuel, I'm going to go ahead and read it for the sake of time, if you don't mind. 1 Samuel chapter number uh, 16, verse number 6. And it came to pass that when they came, that they looked on, uh, on Elah and said, Surely the Lord's anointing is on him. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Matthew 25, verse number 23, verse number 25 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make uh, clean the outside of the cup and, and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. The blind Pharisee uh, cl uh, uh, cleansed, First, that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are likened unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful, beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly uh, appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Timothy says this in 1 Timothy 2, 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves with moths, apparel, with shame, faceless, sobriety, not with broad hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly, or rays, but that which that which becometh uh, women professing uh, godliness with good works. 1 Peter 3, 3 says, Whose adorning let it not be of the outward adorning, the plaiting of the hair, and, and the wearing of gold, and the putting on of apparel, but let the hidden man of the heart, in, and, and that which is not corrupt, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So here it is, Samuel's looking for to, 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 to an anoint king. And so here it is that, that, that Elab is, and he looks good, he's handsome, he's tall, he's strong, he's fair to look at, but it must be him. No. God said, you're looking at all that that looks good. And he looks like he would fit the part. But I see the heart. I have a man after my own heart, whom I want to be in one of king. You see, God does look on the heart. And worship is this. It's about what is in the heart. The heart that has been transformed by that spiritual heart transplant that God places in there. And then that heart that is right before God. You see, the Pharisees was this way. Jesus said, you know what? You look like this. 
No, Brother Justin, if I were to invite you over to my house, my wife does this just way better than me. Trust me. She sometimes puts that out. I just try to help her. <laughs> she, she is more detail oriented than I am. And uh, she's a good dishwasher. If I were to invite you over to my house and I gave you a nice, beautiful glass of milk on the outside, I'd wash my milk. But on the inside, there's a little bit of crime, there's a little dirt, there's a little bit of stuff left over from the last use of the cup. I gave that to you. Would you want to use it? <laughs> so, no, we wouldn't want to use that. And Jesus used this very scenario to the Pharisees. He said, you know what, you have to come clean on the outside, but on the inside, it ain't so clean. God wants us to clean up the inside. But I need to tell you, on the other side of that, you know, some people can say, oh, you're legalistic because you believe that you need to, to dress modestly and you need to dress, dress distinctively. You're legalistic. Wait a second. Legalistic says that's what you need to be saved. You don't need that to be saved. What you need is the blood of Jesus to wash you and cleanse you. Come and reason with him. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive your sins. But the balance is that I would prefer my cup to be clean on the outside and the inside, just as Jesus said. He said, you're like this. You're like the white sepulcher. It looks beautiful on the outside, but really great. Inside it's all dead in its bones. So the balance is, I don't want to be alive on the inside and on the outside. I want to say that I love Jesus, and I want it to be displayed. I want it to be displayed about the way that I live my life. So I want others to look and see He's a Christian, not because I have a big t-shirt on that says, I love Jesus. If you want to wear that, that's fine. It's wonderful. Evangelize. Whatever you want. I'm not really too big in the t-shirts myself, but I have a couple of them. I like what Brother Eli, he, he evangelizes in his neighborhood. But I, I know one thing. Brother Eli not only does it on the outside, but he does it on the inside. So there's a balance. It's not just looking the part. Big, strong, handsome, good looking as a Christian. But it's letting God transform the heart. And when he looks, he says, man, that's my child. They have it on the inside and on the outside. Because the word of God is specific. That the outward adorning, some people are more concerned with, 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 with the adorning of their outward. You know, uh, I work around a lot of women. Some of them get up real early and some of them say, Oh, I slip in it. Don't look at me. Let me make a bunch of day at that time. <laughs> but I wonder if they spend as much and I'm not I'm just, I'm using this as an illustration. But spending as much time the adorning of ourselves before God as what the outward adorning is. And I'm not just talking about worldly things. We can be that way as believers do. We can dress modestly, conservatively, to bring glory and honor to God, but we can spend a lot of time on that too. Are we spending as much time on the things of God as what we are all the outward things? Because it's the inward that God looks and He sees. He sees past all the facades. He sees past all the walls and barriers and labels that we place upon ourselves to look good. And he sees the end word. The word of God is specific. Adorn themselves in modest apparel. And let, let it be the adorning of good works. But let the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, the Bible says, which is in the sight of God, a great price. People can do a lot of things to make themselves look on the outside. Man, man, we got, we got our, our world. Man, some folks, if they had the hair that I have, they would go by themselves some more and get so different hair. Some folks don't like their nose, a little bump on their nose, so they go and they have some 
adjustments to it. Don't like the sag on their face. So they go and get some cuts and get their skin pulled back. I mean, great prices for that. But God says that that spirit that's on the inside, that's the great price. You see, that's paid more than just a dollar or buy a check or a credit card. That's paid with our time and our sugar and our love for God. And I want you to know that's your real worship to God. That's your real worship to God. I'm going to stop here for the sake of time. Anyone have, have any thoughts, things? I could have went into some more specifics, but amen. Sometimes we major on the mind. And we let our minors not be majored on enough. Anybody, any thoughts tonight?